to another episode of Essays and Espresso. Today, we're going to be talking about what is good level design. But before that, we're going to talk about our weeks, talk about what we've been up to, games that we've been playing, shows that we've been watching, all that good stuff. And of course, as always, I'm joined by my two excellent co-hosts. We have Acer. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing very good. Hello, everyone. And, of course, Boken. How are you? Great. Thankfully, we are recording so late that it's now sociable to drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I, I don't really drink much, so I can't relate. I, I'm, a, I'm a basic bitch when it comes to alcohol. I just drink beer. And, and even then, very rarely, because I just don't like alcohol much. Hold on, Bogan, I'm going to send you something. You're on all the pleasures. It's not, it's not pleasurable to me, bro. I mean, I, I, I believe me, I've tried. I've tried whiskey. I've tried rum. I've tried wine. And I've tried sake, even. I, I, I'm just not a fan. I'm not even really a fan of beer. I only just drink it casually, just so I don't look like a loser. Did sake, the Japanese drinking? rice wine. Yeah. Yes. Maybe you something guess. sweet. You guys need okay. this. That that reminds me. <laughs> that reminds me of something fucking hilarious. So there was one time where a friend of mine, because he's so fucking dumb, I'm not going to say who it is. I'm not going to blow him up. But like he was playing Yakuza Zero, and all of, there's like a weird little side quest where like all of the different like hobo characters want different types of alcohol, and he didn't know what sake was, huh. and one of them wanted sake. And he's he was bitching and complaining. He came up with this made up term. He called this is forced exploration. I'm like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> that does that doesn't even sound like it makes any sense. Forced exploration. That that sounds like an, an oxymoron. Like that doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> and and we were trying to help him. Like, what, what do you, you know? What are you looking for? And he's like, sake. And I'm like, that shouldn't be hard to find. He's like, I've been looking everywhere. I can't find it. And we were like, do you even know it? Eventually it dawned on me and my friends who were talking. It's like, do you know what that is? And he's like, no. <laughs> like, so you didn't realize, oh, this one guy wants beer. This other guy wants whiskey. This guy wants champagne. This other guy wants wine. Did it not make, did, did it not click for you that this was alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't because he's such a stupid idiot. <laughs> If you're listening to this, know that I love you and I'm just messing with you. But you have to admit, woof, that was a dumb moment on your part. But um, yeah, <laughs> now you're talking about Yakuza. For the record, I laughed earlier because Asa posted a pic of a holy Bible because he hasn't grasped yet that this is a, a audio podcast. <laughs> no one can actually <laughs> see that picture except us. I don't edit the podcast, so I don't really mind those skits. So, I've been playing The Messenger recently. Have you guys played that game? Yes. No. What I is it? I didn't finish it. You didn't finish it. Well, I'm I am dangerously close to the end. But Del May Cry 5 just dropped, so I don't know. <laughs> I'm <laughs> struggling to to like I I'm thinking to myself like, god, should I finish it? Should I just play Del May Cry 5? But it is a really good game. I like it a lot so far. Um, uh, how did you feel about it, Boken? Um, it was good, except I I played it up to the part where, well, I guess it's it has been out for long enough. There's a big twist, right? Like it's a 2D platformer. Um, there's like a first twist where it starts out at 8-bit and then there's a time skip into the future and yes. it turns into 16-bit. But more importantly, which most people don't really talk about, is that it, when you beat the end boss of the 16-bit era, it goes from a jump and run like 2D side scroller to a kind of a Metroidvania. Like the, the level yeah. design just completely shifts, and that huh. was the point where I thought, that's really smart. Also, the way they incorporate that into the the overall plot was really smart. But I immediately dropped off the game because I had no fucking clue where I needed to go. 
and I kind of just lost interest. And I know there okay. are people who give you hints and all that shit, but I was just like, I don't know where to start. All these areas have barely any connection points, and I just don't want to play this right now. And then I never went back. So this is going to tie into the... And this this was actually the impetus for me coming up with the essay question to begin with. But this game kind of exemplifies to me the very distinct difference between world design and level design. And uh, without going into too much detail to save it for the essay question, I feel that the messenger has excellent level design, but it has extremely lacking world design. And what I mean by that, particularly for the world design, is the lack of interconnectivity between the areas. I think one of the defining aspects of like really great Metroidvanias like Super Metroid and Castlevania Symphony of the Night is how well those the world design is and the sense of how all of the different areas connect to each other in really interesting ways. And the messenger does this very poorly. And the reason is because when you first play through the game, it plays like an extremely straightforward, linear platformer, which isn't a bad thing. It's actually, if like, I think if the game just stayed like that, it would have been perfect. Yeah, it was a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah. But it, 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 but the this twist at the end, or, or halfway through, where they try to turn into a Metroidvania, while it's a cool idea in concept, um, it feels like an afterthought because the way that these levels kind of connect to each other, it's almost as if like if you took one of those linear uh, platformers like its inspiration, Ninja Gaiden, and you were just able to just walk backwards back through those levels. And occasionally there might be a split path that would allow you to connect to the next area or a different area. And that's it. Like, there, there's no real interesting ways that these separate areas are connected to each other. And I think that's the biggest problem. That yeah. being said, I really do like the game. Like, even with that flaw in mind, I still think it's a really good game worth playing. But b before you get into any kind of gameplay, I, I, th I definitely agree with you. Um, it's a cool concept to turn a 2D side-scroller into a real Metroidvania, except... In Metroidvanias, you slowly unlock the map and you learn, like, over time how the world overall is designed. And in this game, because it just funnels you through every level in a linear fashion in the first half, you don't learn any level design. And it's like, it's like if a Metroidvania just dropped you into the middle of the map and all of it is already explored and you just have no fucking clue where to go. Like... Mm -hmm. What, it's just it's overwhelming in a sense and you kind of know okay i know that area because i was there before but i have no idea how to exactly get there what the area just looks like how it combines with the other areas around it it's just i don't know it, yeah it did, i think didn't work for me I, I think a way that this could have been not completely fixed but at least mitigated would have been to make to drop a lot more clues throughout these levels of like oh you can't get to this area but you might to be able to if you had x and obviously you're not going to have x at that point it, and that because that's the way that metroidvanias work where there will be tons of like little areas that you're not you're not supposed to get to yet because you're too early in the game and it kind of leaves you with like a little mental note and obviously more newer ones will will let you leave like literal notes on the map but even like super metro or symphony of the night where you didn't have that ability or that or that function the the reason they're de designed so well is because you typically remember maybe not all of them but they're so distinct that like you remember like there's that fucking power uh health power up and i want that thing but I can't get it yet because I don't have the double jump or I don't have the, the bat form or I don't have the mist form yet or whatever. The messenger lacks this substantially and I get it because they wanted to preserve that twist. But 
you have to then ask, is it worth it if you're sacrificing the design of your game for the sake of a twist that people are going to forget about? I mean, I'm not sure if it's forgotten about. But... I'm, I'm not saying it's forgotten about yet. I'm saying eventually it's not going to matter. Because all that's left is, is going to be the game. And after after years have passed by and people look back on the game, they already know about the twist. Most people go into it, even if they play for the first time, they'll probably know about the twist anyways. It's not going to matter anymore. All, all that's left is the game. Yeah. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of like Spec Ops The Line, where that game like lives and dies based on that one stupid twist. It's like, oh, hey, it's subversive hey, or hey, whatever. Hey, hey. That game is trash. Don't even Whoa, at me. Whoa, what the fuck? Don't at me. That game, that game is trash. I don't give a fuck. Oh my god. I, I think o I'm gonna... Overrated, shock value, trash. Daniel, we have a lot of topics to get to today. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't do this. Look, we all like okay, Spec Ops The Line, but we need to get this moving. I'm exaggerating. Spec Ops is not that bad. I just think it's overrated. I think it's overrated in the sense that there are a lot of flaws that I and a lot of other, other people, I think, like to forgive and forget about because it does certain things really well. Mm. It, it does, but I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> it should be an uh, essay uh, question at some point. Uh, spec, is Spec Ops the line overrated? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, why not have like essay questions where we just talk about one game? Yeah, in, you're, in you're right. Why not? This is so, our show. We can do whatever we want. Yeah, fuck you all. We can do that. Fuck oh, you all. That. We do what we want. <laughs> We're living on the edge. <laughs> We're gonna talk about Spec Ops: The Line <laughs> and how it's trash. <laughs> all right. Again, I'm kidding. It's not trash. It's fine. It's just overrated. Anyways, Acer, what have you been up to? I've been up to a lot, my man. I've been doing so much. I just finished Amnesia Machine per per Picks again. I thought I'd like it. I thought I'd find some nugget in there I liked. I didn't. But also, more importantly... Where is it? Ah! I played... Uh, I began playing Planescape Torment, and I really liked it. Yeah. I really yeah, like what I'm uh, playing through so far. I believe that's Chris Avalone's debut? Possibly? I don't the writer? Know. It's uh, Chris Avalon, though. I know. It is him. Uh, was it last podcast or the one before that where you guys were saying it's like a very highly regarded game? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's one of the Western RPG classics. Like one yeah. of the most highly regarded Western RPGs of all time. Okay, so I for think... For everything... No, wait. For, for the story and nothing else. Oh, Okay. Uh, which okay. which the version of D and D? Which version of D and D is this? I don't think it's D and D at all. At all. Okay, really? real real quick. Um, I just looked it up. This is not the first game he worked on, but it is the first game he wrote. No. Yeah, okay. Actually, anyway, it might be D and D. It might be some weird offspring because it has those classes, right? Like uh, warrior, mage, and priest, or whatever, or thief. Uh, thief, yeah. Yeah. They also have Thacko, which is why I thought it was D&D. Yeah, well, it might be. I might be to talking out of my ass. I <laughs> always connect D&D &D to um, the Forgotten Realms. Mm. And this is very decidedly not the Forgotten Realms. So this is very decidedly not classic fantasy. This no, is a really fucking weird, fucked up world. <laughs> so I'm not that far into the game yet. So I don't really have anything meaningful to say about it other than I really like it. Uh, I think, yeah, but I do think whatever version, if it runs on some tacked out version of TNT, I think a lot of that is very unintuitive. Like a lot of clutter on the screen, which would have probably been streamlined if this game had been released today. But that's not like a huge issue, I guess. The um, I know that most Planescape Torment veterans, when someone asks how to play this game or how to start, mm. the usual advice is put everything into charisma and just talk your way out of every situation. 
because that is where that game shines. The, the oh. gameplay is hot trash. The combat is hot trash. Um, mages are probably broken. I th I, I'm pretty sure mages are still broken, like they are often in D and D. Mm. But the dialogue and the writing, even though it's a lot of text, but the the world building, everything around that stuff is what that game really does well. Yeah. Yeah, I can totally attest to that. I really like that. I did put a lot of stats into charisma and like wisdom or something. So yeah. who knows? Maybe it's gonna be a smooth ride. <laughs> and I also, know, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was gonna change subjects. Just if you want to shoot something in last minute. No. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, Chris Davis, fellow YouTuber, made a video on Planescape Torment that I recommend. Um, mm -hmm. He he loved it and he thought. He thought it was great, and he made some very poignant, uh, you know, points <laughs> about the game. So, give that a watch. I will after I finish it. Just remember, do not trust the skull. Oh, why not? Do not trust the skull. Yeah. the the little The little what? buddy that talks to you at the very start of the game. Mort. Yeah. Mort. So he's he's not trustworthy. Okay. You Keep should that in mind. you should know this. How far I, in are you? I mean, I'm, Asia. I'm like five or six hours or something in. Yeah. If I wiped like out a thief's den. At the end of the tutorial, you basically pull up a note that tells you don't trust the skull. I don't you... read the notes. The fuck? You think I'm some kind of nerd? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're playing Planescape Torment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that, that note was uh, mandatory. I probably like just skimmed no over that way. part. Dude, fuck off. <laughs> Do it right. This game is for reading. You're, you're basically playing an interactive book, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Games should only be about the fun. That's why Spec Up <laughs> the Line was so good. <laughs> yeah, what a fun game. <laughs> now, I, uh, I, I'll dedicate more effort into reading the notes then from now on. I also watched, on Daniel's recommendation, Fate Stay Night. No, Fate Zero. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Uh, did you watch the entire thing? I watched the first two episodes. I was watching it while I was playing Hollow Knight, and then I dropped Hollow Knight for Planescape, and I couldn't. I didn't have two monitors to watch Fate Zero on as well. Jesus but I... Christ. <laughs> what? That's very... Whatever that's... This Whatever That's it is barely you're doing, watching I do it. not approve of it. Okay. I, I I do not approve of watching it in that fashion. Yeah. <laughs> not but I liked it. Torment, watching fucking Fate on a second monitor that you don't have <laughs> while playing two different games. What the fuck? No, 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 no. So Oh god. I I what was the fuck? I was watching Fate Zero while I was playing Hollow Knight, and then I dropped no, Hollow Knight. No, that's the first strike. Yeah, hold on. Then I dropped Hollow Knight for Planescape Torment, and then I didn't have another monitor, so I haven't gone back to Fate Zero. But wait, 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 I'm confused. How come you had two monitors initially, and now you don't have two monitors anymore? I, okay, I have two monitors. I'm not going to alt-tab my way through the episodes. Like, I, I can't be doing that, guys. I can't be both reading all the text and watching the show. Hollow Knight is barely... Like, that barely has a story. That has, like, oh an ambience God. more than any... <laughs> guys! I'm leaving this podcast. What guys. the fuck? This is the worst. <laughs> You've upset me in, like, five ways. <laughs> <laughs> over the last three minutes. Okay. I'm with Boken. I think Boken and I consume shows and movies in the same way where we give it our full undivided attention. I'm not down with this fucking multitasking bullshit. Like, I, like if you're playing an RPG and you're putting a podcast in the background, that's totally fine, right? I think except, that's fine. Except Excuse me, a, that's the exact story. same thing. No, but except when it's a very story-heavy RPG where you have to read a lot of shit. Yeah. I just mean, like, when you're grinding or whatever. The point that I'm trying yeah. to make, though, the point I'm trying to make is that, like, when you're watching a show, it's supposed to be both a visual uh, and audio experience. So if if you're not dedicating both of 
those senses to your viewing experience, you're not getting the full experience. Okay. Guys, I hear I don't hear you because my audio cut out. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, it's fixed, it's fixed. Look, guys. This is the proper way to consume media. Remember that anime I watched <laughs> which didn't make any sense because I kept falling asleep over it? When we started uh, doing B- the podcast. Baki the Grappler? Yeah, B- Baki the Grappler. That show made no sense. <laughs> this is a good show, is my point. I liked it. I'm going to go back to it when I play something on a console again. Oh, my God. Why please. Why can't you just sit down and watch it? <laughs> please explain it to me. Yes, please. <laughs> there, please. Are only, there are only so many hours in the day, guys. You have to if you have to if you have to plan your day out, it's best to multitask these things. No. You know how you know how <laughs> Oh you, my god. You just you, sit down and say, Okay, I have three hours left of the day. I'm going to watch three episodes of Fate Zero. You know, when I was young, there was a uh, invention competition that came to our school and we were all supposed to like invent new items and this is actually very relevant to this discussion because i invented my idea was oh if you have uh what do they call it when you have like a walking stick because you broke your leg or something my idea was that you combine that with a mop so that you can clean your floors <laughs> while you're <laughs> <in> your floor. <laughs> my point is there's no reason to not. There's no reason to divvy up tasks which you could do yes, say, at the same time. Fate Zero is a fucking complex show about twenty different characters in a world you don't understand, and it has fucking action scenes that go on for five minutes. You can't follow that shit if you're playing Hollow Knight at the side. I followed it like, very extensively. There's a no, guy. You didn't. There was like there were like snakes who attacked a girl he knew, so he went in to help her. And then he was in, like, torment for a year or something. And then Arthur was a girl. See, I know everything about this show. I'm the best Fate Zero (laughs) guy. (laughs) You know, uh, something that I find really funny about Fate Zero, though, with that in hindsight, is that, like, when Fate Stay Night was a thing before Fate Zero, like, Saber being King Arthur was actually, like, a really big reveal. Because, like, Mm. because in Fate Stay Night, you don't know who she is for a long period of time until it's revealed and i remember when i first like watched it and re- or rather read the visual novel i assumed it was joan of arc oh and what's really interesting about that is that there's another character in fate zero named caster and he thinks that saber is also joan of arc i was just gonna say that yeah <laughs> that is actually a referencing that the misconception of the fans that is actually like not poking fun but just kind of like acknowledging kind of like a wink so i always thought that was really funny and cool that they did that so i'm gonna continue watching it i'm not gonna watch it your way your wrong way oh my god (laughs) this guy i I can't believe this fucking guy (laughs) When I first watched Berserk, do you think I was like just gonna sit down and watch a twenty-year-old anime? When I first watched the anime before I read the manga, no, I was yes. playing video games the whole time. And oh then the God. twist happened, and I was like, "Wait, what? I actually care now." And then I went back and rewatched it. Are you, oh, I, so you should have oh done it God. right the first the first time. <laughs> no, 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 because I don't have the energy to be just sitting down and watching a movie. Like when I go to the when I go to a cinema, I'm on my phone the entire time playing games very loudly. Oh, you're that guy. No, 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 no. no you're no. that guy. You're fucking with me right now. I don't no. believe you. You're no, just ob- saying that to make me mad. Obviously, obviously, I'm joking. Yeah. You guys. Uh, I can read you. <laughs> here's another story from my childhood, uh, and this has nothing to do with the subject material, but it's very funny. Uh, my mom, she knew the Icelandic boxing champion. She, he was like a friend of a friend, and I, he uh, encouraged my mom to make me practice boxing, and he was my trainer. Uh, he was like training all the boys. 
and he invited us to go to a cinema with him. We were watching Pirates of the Caribbean 3, I think. The and bad one. there was this guy on the phone the whole time. And also, my trainer was on the phone the whole time, being very loud. And they were both doing it. But my trainer took it as a very offensive thing that the other guy was doing it. <laughs> and he was like yelling at him right before the break. And then after the break, he said to us, hey, do you guys want some popcorn or some sodas? And we were like, yeah, we'll have this and this. And he was like, okay, awesome. I'll go fetch it. And everybody went outside. And then when he came back in, the other guy didn't come back. And no one Mm. noticed. And I thought, like, I still to this day think that the the Icelandic boxing champion knocked somebody out right there. (laughs) What a hypocrite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was hypocritical. But Amazing. yeah, so Fate Zero, uh, I don't know if it's that good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh my no, god. I'm going... <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Let's change the subject. I liked it. I'm going to continue watching it. All right. Uh, let's comp- I'll take that compromise. At least you liked it, even if you're watching it wrong. <laughs> Bokin, <laughs> what have you been up to? You know, you didn't find that note because it wasn't paying attention. Because <laughs> it was doing something else on the side. <laughs> this isn't okay. <laughs> like, look, I, I understand multitasking. I played <laughs> Path of Exile today, and I, I watched, like, two different shitty Netflix horror movies on the second monitor because part of exile doesn't need my full attention and horror movies when they are that shitty don't either that's okay but when i watch something that's good that has like you know an intricate story and characters i need to fucking look at that how you you need to fully experience it You, you like like even when you're when you're fully paying attention to it it still can be easy to miss details and that's why like Rewatching stuff can also be like a, a great experience because then you're like, oh, there's a there's that bit of foreshadowing. Oh, I understand this better. Oh, this makes more sense. Oh, I didn't pick up on that before. This is how they were constructing the themes of the show and blah blah blah, all that shit. Hmm. How the fuck are you like? How the fuck are you gonna pick up on like half of that if you're playing Hollow Knight and Planescape Torment? <laughs> I wasn't watching it while I was playing Planescape Torment. I only watched it with Hollow Knight. Planescape also, Torment is... Look, Hollow Knight is not very involved. You can watch something while you play that. Dude, I also yeah, have to ask, from the game why did you... side, But there's so much environmental storytelling in that game, too. Yeah, but that calls... that You don't need to pay attention to that. That comes through, <laughs> like, via ambience. I also have to ask, why did you drop Hollow Knight? Were you not enjoying it? No, I was really enjoying it. I just wanted to play Planescape Torment. Oh, fair enough. I'll go back to it. I'll go I back mean, the to game it. is actually complete now. Like, We had this conversation. Yeah, I'm just saying, oh boy, it took him a while, but good on them for <laughs> making it free. You know what? It probably wouldn't be a bad idea to just read like Wikipedia articles about shows and then say I watched them. <laughs> I would sniff that out. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. I, I'd just so, be yeah. like, I smell some bullshit. <laughs> mm, mm. Oh, Aesir, Aesir, who's this character? And I'm like, oh, yes. And you just hear me tapping away, <laughs> Googling in the in background. <laughs> <laughs> Wikipedia entry. <laughs> uh, th- that's not a real character. You're trying to bait me. Like, why did it take you five minutes to figure that out? <laughs> <sighs> but I yeah, feel like I we've... played. Uh, I played a <laughs> game called Trials Rising. What anime well. did you watch with it? <laughs> <laughs> We're not getting into that yet. Uh, um, that's actually a pretty fucking hard game, and I don't think I can. Actually, I could probably put on a sitcom on the second monitor where I only need to listen to it but uh, yeah that game is hard and That's I kind of hate uh, it and I kind of love it at the same time isn't, mm, it, isn't that the motorcycle game yes 
Um, yeah, it, it's a, been a long running series, I'm pretty sure, but this is the first of these that I've played. And uh, I really like the concept. I mean, I like the, the core gameplay. It's, a, it's just a really complex uh, physics game, basically. And you have this, this motorcycle and you can go forward and you can hit the brakes and then you can adjust your motorcycle midair and that's all there is in terms of like uh, controls. But the fun, of course, comes from from hitting all the right angles, the way you land. And then there are little tricks where you can do bunny hops and, you know, you need to, to approach ramps a certain way to get that right amount of speed. And then the levels are designed in a way in a way where if you do that perfectly and you get that amount of speed at that moment, then you can like skip the next two ramps and perfectly land on the next one. And you have to find your fastest way through that that track. That's like what it's about, basically. And it's really cool. Like you can tell it's it's complex. It has a really uh, surprisingly great tutorial which is called the, the Trials Academy or something. And I think the people who tell you how the game works are uh, Im important or well-known Trials players who actually got to do like a voiceover and like play their own characters. Huh, and they kinda, that's cool. They kind of explain to you like, mm -hmm. okay, this is this is how, how this trick works. And if you want to play Trials, like... That's one of the first things they tell you is a lot of a lot of the people who play this game, if they never learn it, they just think hitting gas all the time is the best way to play it, right? And that's that's totally not the right way to play it because airtime is your enemy. Like in the air, you're not acce accelerating, so you're going slower. And uh, they can like change up the level design in a way where if you just hit the gas, then you will like jump and land on the next ramp like straight up where it bounces you back and that of course slows you down and all that shit. So that is cool. Um, there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to master and that is that is great. What I hate about this game is, uh, and I'm not sure why this is still a thing if this series has been going on for so long, is the checkpoint system which is basically there's a checkpoint every two meters. Like every time you get through a ramp or a difficult section, you just hit a new checkpoint. And that is a fucking problem because if you if you fall, you can either restart the track or you can go back to the next checkpoint. However, the, the, the checkpoints are so frequent that like if you fail a certain specific really hard ramp, you fall down and you go back to the next checkpoint, then like you're, you're right at that ramp and you're gonna just like you're, you're, you're standing still and then you start driving. So you approach the ramp the second time with a completely different speed than what you would mm. have normally if you go through the track with a good flow. So it doesn't, and, it doesn't, uh, the checkpoint doesn't save your uh, acceleration or your. Mo uh, uh, angle of movement or anything like that. Yeah, your inertia. Inertia. Yeah, exactly. And that that means it it makes it really difficult to properly practice a track without restarting every time. And that is that gets so frustrating. The the harder the game gets. I can and see it, how that would be a problem. It's just such a bad design decision to me. It did just, like you just need to space out the checkpoints a bit so I can. It, it's a game about flow. The perfect trials run through a track is one where you don't have to restart. But for that to happen, you need to learn the whole track and you need to know like the transitions between the difficult parts, right? That's like, I mean, I play an instrument and if I play like a really difficult like keyboard lick, I need to learn how to go into that from the part where I'm coming from and how to end to transition to the next part. If I couldn't, like if, if I somehow was uh, not able to practice that, I would probably never get it down in actual, while actually playing the song. So I don't know, it's, it's I, right now I don't want to play that game anymore because it makes me so mad now that I'm at the harder tracks where it actually matters. And mm. yeah, 
That's that's my, my problem with the game right now. I'm not sure if I will go back maybe when I'm through the games that just released recently, but yeah. Uh, cool yeah, game. We have, yeah. we have so we have so many uh, crazy games that are coming up in the next yeah. few days. Some of them are already out. Yeah, it's shit. <laughs> like Sekiro coming out at the end of the month. Like Jesus Christ. Double May Cry just came out. Ugh. Nuts. Also, when this podcast releases, will be like two months in the future. Uh, oh yeah, yeah we recorded yeah, we true. recorded this in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on! It's not gonna take that long. <laughs> Anyways, we we're, we're we're about to have uh, I don't know what you would call this an argument. No, hopefully not. <laughs> not hopefully a, not too a heated. Blood feud. This is the oh. angry section of the podcast, the angry portion. So, full disclosure, I love Gundam. Gundam is one of my favorite franchises, and uh, Boken just recently watched 8th MS Team and Thunderbolt, and based on what I've heard, he does not have favorable things to say. So, Boken, go ahead. <laughs> you will be surprised. I actually kind of like Thunderbolt. Eighth Yay! MS team, not so much. At um, least you liked Thunderbolt. We, we should at give le- a little bit more of context here that uh, all this started when I dropped a hot take on tw- on Twitter where I sa- basically said that all of Mega is trash. And, um, and I did of- not take kindly to that being a Gundam nut. Yes, a lot of other people didn't either. Um, the thing is... I don't watch a lot of mecha because I don't like it, because it's a, it's just a genre I don't care about. And the parts of both 8th and 8th... Oh, God, that name will fuck me up. Mm-hmm. My German tongue. Um, <laughs> eighth, 8th MS eighth. team and Thunderbolt. The parts I liked about it were decidedly the parts that weren't about the mechs. So I think Thunderbolt has great characters and like really cool music. I was gonna say, was the wasn't the jazz fucking awesome? Like, yeah, it was really creative. I actually, you you told me that you recommended it the mess team to be because you remember it had it had good characters and mm-hmm. develop developed them over like the course of, of only a few episodes. I would say Thunderbolt developed the characters better and they were they were more interesting and that only was an hour long. Okay. Um, I, I, it's f- just to make it clear, I haven't seen 8th MS Team in like seven years. So uh, my memories of the show are <laughs> kind of fuzzy. So yeah. I, I mean, it, I, it didn't take I the characters just, there. I just remember the show for a few things, right? Like I remember... Th- for its time, the production values, I remember being very good. Uh, the I liked the characters a lot. I especially liked the main character for his ingenuity. I remember the main character, the thing I really admired about him was just how he, he he's a character that I appreciate because he was one that got out of situations with his smarts. Like he didn't just, he wasn't just like, oh, I'm the best pilot ever. And that's how he got out of a situation. He was usually like really intelligent and he came up with like creative ways to solve problems. And that's what I really liked about him. Um, and I also remember like the fights being weighty. Like I remember like the way that the animations for certain fights were con- like the, the way that they conveyed a sense of movement and weight. I remember being very impactful. For eighth the Miss team, I didn't get that at all. Okay, fair um, enough. Usually, like, that's one of my biggest problems with Mecha in general is it's... It, the, the robots just explode. They get hit, they explode. And that's it. Like, there's nothing cool about it. Uh, the... the I, I'm not explaining that very, very well, but... You're saying um, it's not cool? I mean... It's you're, really you're basically not. saying explosions aren't cool. They really aren't. Your character exploding is like the least uh, cool and satisfying death I can think of. I think characters like mm. getting punched into a wall, getting sliced up, slumping over, 
while cursing the other guy or something like that is way more exciting than them just getting hit by gunfire and then the robot explodes. Um, I hope you'll appreciate then that in the original Mobile Suit Gundam that the two main characters, their final battle actually devolves into the two of them fencing with like in 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 a like in an in this room where there's like zero gravity so they're like floating around trying to like stab each other with rapiers so outside of the mechs Out, outside of the mechs but that was because yes. their mech that that was because they they were fighting so hard with the mechs beforehand that they blew each other's mechs up and then it devolved into them like sword fighting in zero gravity which i thought was pretty cool i that sounds like something I'd appreciate. Because, I mean, that is really my problem with with Thunderbolt and Mecha in general is I understand there are cool characters there. I There's probably a lot of cool politics in Gundam that I'd enjoy. But whenever they get into the Mechas, I just want to turn it off. Because it's, it's just... People in Mechas aren't really put into direct physical harm except when they explode and that is boring to me and then otherwise like they don't really exert themselves they just they they there's like a five layers of thick metal plating be between them and whatever wants to destroy them and that that puts such a such a distance into the action that bothers me and that is why i don't like mechs and i don't like giant machines fighting i've never liked that yeah, I mean, I personally can't agree with that, but it, I mean, that's your preference. So I can't really say that you're wrong. It's just, yeah. It's... But it's, how is it not way more exciting when someone just directly punches someone else in the face? It's a different type of excitement. Like, it, one is much more like visceral and guttural, and the other one is more fantastical and over the top. Well. You can, you, I mean, anime can be over the top with, like, crazy powers and shit. Don't need what? a giant machine for that. But, like, a giant machine could add, like, different variables, and it can add, like, you know, different realms of coolness and style to it. Like, shit, it, the mechs themselves look cool, right? And you can attach, like, giant fucking laser cannons or, like, a dumb, like, mini gun or whatever, like... They can be cool in a different way. You know, and the, you know what I see? Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it's like, but at the end of the day, I don't really watch Mecha specifically because I love Mecha fights, even though I do enjoy them. It's, but I, I mainly watch them because I like the characters in the story. If, if I'm watching it and I find myself only enjoying the fight scenes, then I'd say that's a problem unless it's a movie. If it's a, that's if it's a, if it's a that's, whole series, that's a problem. That's true, but I can watch other series and stuff where I get good characters and good politics or fucking science fiction or whatever that don't have mechs. Like, the, the defining trait of the genre is the giant robots. And that yeah, one falls completely flat for me. I mean, yeah, and if you don't like that, you don't like that. Yeah, so um, I, I, I mean, that's why I say I'm sure there are good Gundam shows that I might enjoy, but I would definitely watch them despite the giant robots. Sure. And that's my problem. Like, you know what I see when I see a Gundam? I think that shit is completely impractical and will never exist in real life because it's a dumb design. And I mean, I can't, I can't yeah, but that. That, doesn't, that doesn't bother me in the slightest. Yeah. Because, like, it's, it's, it's supposed to be, like, hyper reality right like that's just that tends to be like a lot of fiction they're not generally speaking they're not supposed to be these like accurate depictions of reality or what might be reality one day they're supposed to be hyper reality it's enhanced reality it's like a, it, it's like a romanticized version of reality so yes the mechs are very impractical a lot of the time and they they chances are they will never exist in a practical sense but i don't care <laughs> they're cool okay. no, but like it seems so superficial to me 
there's no good I'm, i mean okay i haven't maybe there are shows that, that do that mm, but if if there was that, one that really went into the science of how the mech works and then they come up like in, in a fight scene they then come up with a clever way of oh i'm gonna use this function in this way to, to overpower that guy that that could be cool they didn't do well, that I in hms team i mean i don't really agree when you say like it's shallow or because and the the intention behind the mobile suit in the original gundam was that it was supposed to be uh it was supposed to be representative it was supposed to be symbolic of the main character taking on responsibility that's why in like the very beginning of gundam amuro doesn't know how to handle the gundam very well and he just stumbles and he slowly as the show goes on becomes more adept because he's learning to deal with his problems. And by the end of it, he becomes uh, an ace pilot. Because that's that, that's also... That's just... That's so that's also supposed to send a message... Because at the time, it's meant to be kind of a kid show. It's meant to, like, sub- subliminally, like, convey this message to kids. Like, yeah, life's going to be rough. And it's going to be daunting. And there's going to be things that you're not going to understand or know how to deal with, but eventually you're going to get used to it and things will get better. Sure. I can see that character, I can see that character arc happen in like 30 different ways that don't necessarily involve the robot. If they do involve the robot, then I I kind of need the explanation of why it is so difficult to control it, which well, though, at the, the big- shows I watched didn't really get go into that. Well, in the very beginning, like, Amuro, that was, like, his, in the first episode, that was, like, the very first time he ever, like, sat in a mobile suit. So, he had zero experience, but, and the only reason that he won that first battle was because the the Gundam itself is, like, uh, you know, it's more powerful than, like, the average mobile suit. But, like, he, he had no idea what he was doing. And he was, like, trying to read the manual as he's, like, fighting these other dudes. And he's trying to understand what's, you know, how to control it. But, like, that's, like, that's, obviously, it's not the only way that they convey how he grows. Like, it's not just that he becomes, like, an ace pilot. Like, at some point, he suffers from PTSD and, like... Uh, it's actually like this really infamous moment in Gundam where like Commander Bright just like slaps the shit out of him because he's like he ref- he was like stuck in his room in the dark and he just didn't want because he was he was just so done so tired of like killing people and so so tired of just like dealing with the war and Commander Bright just like came in just like beat the shit out of him trying to like snap him out of his PTSD or, or I think it's called like shell shock. It's the right. same thing. Yeah, same thing. Shell shock is the old uh, World War old, <coughs> World War One name for the for mm. the uh, phenomenon. Right. right. But it, again, it to me it just kind of sounds like it, it, it's it's a personal thing, like, and I think that's valid. Like, you, you don't have to like Mex, and I personally I think they're cool. I like them, but. If you're not down for them, you know, fair enough. Yeah. Where do you where do you stand on like superheroes? Because um, superheroes are also very impractical in their own world. They are, what do you mean impractical? Um like a guy like Superman should not be punching criminals. He should be like generating electricity by you know going with so- solar panels to the sun or like pulling a rope which like winds up some reactor which generates electricity batman shouldn't be you know putting on a costume he should be spending his money you know the uh reforming criminals and you know giving it away to the poor so that there's some manner of stability like they are impractical in the world they inhabit but there are still a good analog to tell very reasonably, oh well, to tell very deep stories about human nature. And I think, I, like, because originally superheroes were just a, were just a, a mechanism to sell comic books to children, and mechas probably started out that way, but it's only later when they go, okay, let's tell a serious story with this as, 
like with the Mecca as the medium. So I I don't know. I just I'm just saying that like, I don't know if you can have it. I don't know if you can have like a real superhero or a real Mecca, which goes into how why it makes sense for them to be Mecca with their to be mechas or for there to be superheroes. I think it's just kind of like a conceit of the genre you have to accept before moving forward. Yeah, there's a certain level of suspension of disbelief. Sure. I mean, those are interesting examples you bring up for Superman and Batman. You can't really say that Batman doesn't do that. Like, okay, he can be Batman and still spend part of his money on, you know, reforming society, right? Were, those are two different people, basically. And yeah, Superman is just Superman is just terrible. I hate Superman. I love yeah, Superman. I, fuck, I fucking hate Superman. You guys are both wrong. Superman is like <laughs> like uh, um, what's his name? Part three, Jojo. Like uh, Star Star Platinum. Yeah, Jotaro, who is just completely overpowered <laughs> <laughs> and completely unrelatable. Hey, I think- hey, at least at least. At least Jotaro is funny. Uh. He at least has funny moments, and he's cool. Superman is just lame. He's a Boy Scout. No. Yeah. No, guys, let's not do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, um, my, my favorite superhero parts are usually the more human parts. Like, if we go into Mech, for example, uh, we could maybe compare it to the first Iron Man movie, which... Um, that first half when he starts uh, experimenting with the suit and learns how to handle it. That's like mm-hmm. the most, that, that's one of the funnest parts for me in any Marvel movie. Or take yeah. Spider-Man Homecoming. Spider-Man has actually like, he he has an arc where he grows and he actually learns to I don't need this complex suit. I have to become a better person first and my decision making has to improve before I can, you know, take on weird uh, experimental battle suits and try to fight crime that way. Mm. But surely there is a mecha show which explores the, the uh, themes very similarly, right? Because even even in uh, even in the Marvel universe, Iron Man doesn't need to fight crime. Like, the idea that he's just going to go into the Middle East and shoot up the Taliban—it's insanity. He right? does that in the first I've... Iron Man. I never yeah, it's, it. it's not. It's not the Taliban. It's like some terrorist organization. Isn't that before Dude, he becomes? I, 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 I never watched it. So. I mean, Tony no, Stark is a weapons tra- trader, right? Yeah, but also he also he flies. Remember, there's a cool scene where like a tank shoots at him and he dodges it and shoots a small missile at it and it blows up. He's like freeing women from the. Is they, they're called the Ten Rings? It's a terrorist organization. Point is, it's it's the uh, the morals that movie practices are very shady but that stuff doesn't actually matter it's just about having fun with the character it should matter no it's not what the movie is about like you can frame it as about that well it isn't about that it could be about that you can point to a movie similarly uh it's not a good movie, but you could point to like Batman v Superman. It's not a good movie, like I said, but that's like, hey, Superman, you're just going in there and you're just, you know, punching up terrorists. You think that's okay? You think, like, you think you shouldn't be put to heel? You should just answer to nobody. So, so um, you know, it can't be about that, but it can also just be about having fun with Tony Stark. Okay. I haven't watched the first uh, Iron Man in a long time, but isn't the point of that movie at the end that he realizes the the shit he has done with his trading, and that yeah. he actually tries to like turn into a better way of making the world like like improving the world? Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of about that. In, well, like, but again, we get into the, he is redundant in his own world because he has an artificial intelligence which can do anything, right? He, we don't need a man put, putting on a suit and shooting up the terrorists when we have artificial intelligence which renders so much of society unnecessary. So the conceit doesn't work. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I mean, that's why I like Watchmen, right? 
because that is actually the tropes of superheroes thought through to their logical conclusion, which then yeah. turns someone as powerful as Superman into like a complete alien asshole that doesn't care about humanity anymore. Yeah, and like the smartest man in the world doing the dumbest thing one could possibly imagine because his like the the moral grounding of that man is so far removed from reality, but he can justify yeah. it because he he still believes to in some extent on these sort of Uberman super uh, hero moralities. And then a squid kills New York. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's uh, real, so good. Real quick, um, before we move on, uh, you did say that you liked Thunderbolt more than 8th MS Team. Uh, would that carry over to the fight scenes as well? Or did you feel about the same? Um, there was one fight scene I liked, which was when... Uh, what's his name? Eo Fleming goes mm-hmm. up against three snipers. Oh yeah! Because that fight, that I, the rest of the fight scenes, I just didn't know what the fuck was going on. I had no idea who was shooting who. It was all just flashy lights and people just flying around and getting blown up, and you can barely tell the mechs apart because one is like dark, or well, somewhat of a gray color. The other is like dark green. And it's all set in space, and I, I had no fucking clue what was happening. Okay. Uh, I thought you would have at least liked the one fight where it was in first person in the perspective of the pilot being attacked by the Gundam. I thought oh, yeah, that, that was really that, neat. That was a neat visual. Uh, I found, the f- you know, when... when um, what are the, the gray ones? Are the Fetties or the Zeons? The gray ones are the Fetties. Yeah, the Fetties. When they go up... Um, or when they fly out and they all get shut shut down by snipers, mm-hmm. and the snipers are just laying there relaxed and calm. Yeah, and they're then chilling. Suddenly, you Fleming goes through the uh, hatch opening of one of the snipers and just shoots him in the face. Yeah, it was more yeah. exciting than any other action scene because it was just like him being up close and personal and like fuck your shit, fuck your mecha bullshit, <laughs> <laughs> shooting you in the fucking face. What something that I appreciated about Thunderbolt was like Eo Fleming is on the side of the Fetties, and the Fetties, while they're not like exactly the good guys, they're more portrayed in a positive light than the Zeon. But I felt that the Zeon were more sympathetic. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, because the Zeon part is all all told uh, from the perspective of that one squad who mm-hmm. are like. What are they, veterans or, I mean, war victims who lost part of their limbs? Yes. And they're still putting out into the war. <laughs> and then yeah. one guy becomes a super soldier because My... they cut out, cut off his last arm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so fucked up. <laughs> I, I th- although I'd say, like, my favorite, favorite part of the entirety of Thunderbolt is that, like, two-minute sequence where the Xeon soldier, I forget his name, um... Uh, he's doing training and for some reason it like sparks a memory and he starts remembering oh it's because of the music that he put on it reminded him of his past and it goes through like it's like a couple of minutes of showing basically his his life story and that flashback with the music playing and by the end of it you know it, it's just stops and he's like sitting in the cockpit and he's like crying and i thought that was just i felt like i connected with that character in like those two minutes more than i have for other characters i spent like entire series with yeah that's why i like thunderbolt i was just i I was caring about these characters even though i had seen them in like three scenes when that one chick tries to to kill herself um Mm -hmm. with an overdose i totally gave a shit and she was barely a character, but that scene made it work. Yes, I, I agree. That was a, that was a really good scene as well. Well, I'm glad you at least liked Thunderbolt, even if you weren't a fan of a MS team. Did you ever Although, watch? Uh, did you ever watch Code Geass? No. <sighs> Is this a trick question? 
No, yeah, well, no, I'm not trying to convince you it's like a great show. It's a show I thought was very good when I was like younger. And then I talked, the first time I did a podcast with Daniel, he asked me how much I knew about anime. And I was like, oh, you know, I've watched all the standard stuff, like Full Metal Alchemist and Death Note and Code Geass. And he was like, oh, yeah, you know, Full, Full Metal Alchemist. Oh, yeah, Death Note. And I was like, Code Geass. And he was like, oh, yeah, I don't like that show. And uh, I retroactively don't like that show either because we've had a lot of conversations about it where we've un- uncovered how uh, kind of pandering and uh, made by marketing that show is. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's it's high school drama, it's superpowers, it's mecha, it's politics, it's like roy- royalty fighting one another. But it's also like Death Note where it's the super, pow- super genius is fighting... Like it's just everything thrown into the mix. It is a melting pot that they, they just threw everything in there to try and like appeal to everyone and it somehow worked, but like <laughs> <laughs> Oh god. I think it's a I think it's terrible. Like even <laughs> if you even if you divorce it from the fact that like it's super pandering, it's just bad. Like it's so poorly written. And what you know, and, and it annoys me so much because it's one of those shows that people praise to high heaven. They think it's a masterpiece. And, you know, people, you can like whatever you want. You know, I'm not going to judge you But you can't you for like it. that. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. I'm like, you know, you can like what you want. I'm not going to judge you. But, like, I, I genuinely, honest to goodness, from the bottom of my heart, think that that show is terribly written. I think it is so stupid. It is incomprehensibly bad. And I'm gonna rewatch I, it one day. I need to know. Uh, yeah. Okay. Bogan, you should watch it. It has Max. Just tell us oh, if yeah, you like I it. I should watch that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if I'm, gonna, if I'm ever gonna catch up on a show with Max, it's gonna be Vision of Escaflown. <laughs> oh, I love that show. That's a great show. I remember um, liking it. I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> I, I will I will say this, on the off slim chance that you ever decide to watch another Gundam anything, I would strongly recommend War in the Pocket. It probably has the least amount of actual mechs in it. Like, if I remember correctly, I think there are only two mech battles uh, between the six episodes. Mm, that sounds right. The one at the very start, one at the very end, and that's it. Yeah. And that's like a good show. Yeah, it's 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 one of my favorites. It's short, six episodes. And uh, I think that's a show where you can you really connect with the characters, especially. Hmm. I think it's uh, I think it's great. It's underrated. It's, uh, I, yeah. Someone... Uh, once showed me a clip of an anime where I think it's all about a normal dude going up against Max, and like he's just fighting them and like the point of the show is he's outsmarting giant robots and I think I might find that exciting I'm, I have no idea what it was called but um, I, don't, because, I because don't know Mac- Mech fights are so distant to me because it's just metal clashing and getting blown up. But if Isn't there's there actually a... a person in in harm's way, and he has to overcome this, like it's it's like a good boss fight in that sense. That might be exciting. Mm-hmm. We need to uh, we need to get on a break quickly. But I I would just want to ask before we do. Isn't there an anime currently running about? A kid who saves the world, like he uses a mech to save the world from like a Godzilla attack or something, and he saves the world. But then the next day, it's like a Groundhog Day where it's all just reset. Never heard of that. Oh, I I heard about that. I heard about that summer, and I'm super interested to watch that when it's uh, all out. Hey, One Punch Man is coming soon. Oh, really? Yes, very cool. soon. But uh, do we have anything more to say about Max? No, I'm good. Okay, that was uh, a lot less heated than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Neon Genesis, guys. Ah! Evangelion. That has no. Max in it. No. We're taking a break. 
We'll see you in a little bit. Welcome back, everyone. And it's time for the essay question. So let's get our espressos ready. And uh, let's talk about what is good level design. So just to make it clear, level design is not the same as world design. And I, personally speaking, I think the distinction is level design is based around uh, testing the player based on their understanding of the mechanics. And I think that world design is how the world uh, connects with itself. Much like how uh, Dark Souls has that one moment in like uh, the Firelink Shrine where you take the elevator back down to it. That is usually considered like a watershed moment in like mm. really great interconnected world design. One of these days we'll make an episode without referencing Dark Souls. Maybe. Such a Why? great. It's that's a such a great game. game. One would say uh, one of the best. I would say that too, until you uh, ring the bell. No, not the bell. Until you uh, finish Sans Fortress, and then the rest of the game can fuck off. No. <laughs> I think people are too down on the second half of Dark Souls. It's yeah, a lot of I agree. it's a lot of empty spaces. You know what? Actually, there's a lot of good stuff too. Like the demons ruins, out, aside from the um, the lava pits and like the uh, bed of chaos. It's still good stuff. Level design. I think the best answer to give is it depends very much on what the goals of the game is. Yes, I would agree with that. Because, like, there are no universal laws which you could apply to something like um, a Silent Hill and also something like a Elder Scrolls. Obviously, like, what is or isn't good level design is incredibly subjective, but I think we can at least, like, hash out, like, what can we consider, like, general standards. Hmm. Yeah, would you say that a game like Skyrim or Morrowind has level design yes yeah to some extent no you know what those games probably have just world design i mean you yeah, could kind of yeah. you could watch at a dungeon in a very isolated way um i'm not yeah, sure see, if that counts as level design though mm. i would i would say a dungeon is an example of level design i would say like the overworld is an example of world design hmm yeah, so uh, probably that would have been a bad example to compare against Soundtale, but my point stands. Mm. I mean, not to, to get too anal about this definition, but I guess you could... Like a Demon Souls doesn't have a real world. It has individual stages, and mm. those also sometimes have um, shortcuts, like Dark Souls has them. But it just like makes the level... It opens up the level, but not the world. Well, you can, if you want to take it in a, if you want to look at it in a different direction, you can actually consider each of those different levels their own worlds. Sure. Dun, dun, dun. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying I necessarily agree with that assessment, but I think it might be a valid way of looking at it. Personally, I just consider those different levels that are like tightly connected and, you know, tightly designed. But if you want to look at it that way, then I don't, again, I don't think I agree, but I, I can see the thought process behind that. I think uh, we can still say that each one of every, I, I think every uh, Dark Souls and Demon Souls level has, like, that you can say there's level design there, but I don't know if I would call what you do in an Elder Scrolls level design. I think that's, I think the goal, well, I don't know, well, because just because the goals of the game and why you're traversing it is different doesn't mean it doesn't take design. 
Well, it does take design. It's just a different type of design. Yeah. I think in the problem in Elder Scrolls is that you're not really tested by a, by a level. Like you're supposed to play your own character and you can, when you enter a dungeon, you can hopefully solve it in different ways or with different abilities. Um, but that's not like the, the level itself isn't that complex. Maybe it has a few ways that you can go, but there's no real mechanic. Like the, the, the level itself doesn't have a mechanical depth to it. It's just how you make your way through it. Meanwhile, if you take an RPG like, for example, uh, Deus Ex, Human Revolution, the, those missions need to have level design because they need to accommodate your abilities. They need to have stealth ways. They need to have uh, f ways where gunfights can happen. They need to have turrets that you can take over because they need to enable all those play styles. So there's like a puzzle element to level design, which there isn't necessarily in world design. Mm, well, sometimes you can you can change something in the world and it will you know cause an effect somewhere else. But yeah, level design is definitely smaller and more intricate, I'd say. Yeah, uh, I think that's. I think I think we should preface this by saying that we're just shooting the shit right now. We're not willing to die on any of these these hills. Yeah, I, so I think let's, that's uh, most of these essay questions. Where because I feel like I feel like if we don't just put that out there, we're going to be stuck on trying to define this for the next ten minutes. Let's just yeah. go with <laughs> let's just go with that clarification and move forward. I think a good universal law is that clutter tends to be bad, right? You don't want something that's way too busy for the player to be able to read what's going on. Well, that sounds to me like an aesthetic choice. No, well, not really. It could be both. Uh, like I would say Amnesia The Dark Descent has really good level design. And I would say Amnesia A Machine for Pigs has sporadically good level design, but a lot of clutter. A lot of times where just barrels are all over the floor and gives you no idea of where you're supposed to go. See, but that's well designed to me because that's the <laughs> <laughs> that's the overarching uh, problem of having to navigate and understand where you are. Well, we just said that level design is more supposed to test you on relevant skills. Hmm. Okay. Well, then a game like Amnesia the Dark Descent would have world design rather than level design. Hmm. Now, now I'm starting. Now I'm starting to think whether like that's actually an accurate definition anymore because I'm, I also think back to the palaces in Persona Five, and you can't really say that the palaces test the player on their understanding of the the mechanics. There are some mechanics to it, but like I would still say the level design for the palaces are really good because they're they're fun to explore. They're very visually interesting, and they reward the player for their exploration. And there there's nice set pieces thrown about that uh, keeps it varied. So I would say that it also depends on the game, right? Sure. Yeah. Like that's the problem with RPGs. A lot of them, there's there aren't really like platformer skills to to test. Right. The only way Persona Five can test your your skill through level design would be in evading enemies uh, through stealth. Either guess... evading them or attacking them from behind. Yeah. Yeah. Would you guys say that a game like uh, Baldur's Gate has level design? Because, I've never played it. Because, like, not necessarily Baldur's Gate itself, but you can take a game, you can take that genre of game and make the design of the level be very important to the way you navigate it. You know, be very important in, uh, not the way you navigate it, in communicating to the player how to navigate the space and all that stuff. So, but a lot of those air, but a lot of those games tend to have just here's a box. And here are the houses you can get into. Baldur's Gate has very complex dungeons. Like Baldur's Gate played, 2 in particular. I've never um, played those games. I'm just using them as examples. Yeah. Like Baldur's Gate 2 has 
it drops you into a dungeon, but then you find that like, you, you need to get certain items in parts of the dungeon that you need to use in later um, parts of it. Or there, there are like puzzles where you, you come into a room and there's like um, letters on the floor. And mm. if you step on the wrong letter, you get blasted by, by like a fire um, beam. And so you need to find a note or a book and read it and find out like, oh, this this used to be the temple of, I don't know, some goddess. And then you need to move in the like you need to move over the letters to spell out the name. And that will be the safe road. Mm. Shit like that. And that is not world design, I guess. That is specific level design of the dungeon and that tests your awareness. And um, yeah, it, I it, it, it's also where the, where the enemies are placed when fights happen. Um, yeah, I think that's that's level design. So I was thinking, um, I think level design is also not not just now that I think about it. It's not just how well a game uh, tests the player on their understanding of the mechanics, but I think it's also based around how the game facilitates the player's desire to explore. Because mm. obviously you're exploring levels. Yeah, but there are... Uh, I don't know if I would phrase it that way, though, because I don't know okay. if a game necessarily needs you to want to explore. I'm not saying it has to be that way. I'm saying that can be an element of it. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, like like let's just let's break it down to like the fucking fundamentals. Let's look like an uh, like an NES platformer it is linear as fuck like Ninja Gaiden, right? There is no exploration. You're going from point A to point B. And that game will test you on your understanding of the game's mechanics. However, uh, isometric dungeon crawlers like uh, Boulder's Gate like or, or Icewind Dale or whatever. Um, I don't know if those dungeons are randomized or anything, mm -mm. but they are? No, they aren't. They aren't. Okay. So in that instance, I would say that with, with games like that, those are testing you more on uh, how well you explore the areas, but that is that is also tied to how well the the developers were able to design the area and making you want to explore. Hmm. And then you have games like um, a Half Life, which doesn't really want you to explore so much as it wants to lead you from point A to point B very efficiently. Yes. Yeah. So. So it's it's it goes back to uh, what we said earlier about it needs to facilitate the specific goals of the given game. But are there any universal laws which we can apply? Like I what is good level design? Yeah. If I had to take, if I had to like hazard a guess, like throw something out there, I think it's a game that uh, prioritizes uh, the game's philosophy through its level design. So like RPGs, you know, they're about feeling like going your own adventure, dungeon crawling and all that. If the level design does a good job of adhering to that philosophy, then that's good level design. Mm -hmm. Ninja Gaiden. It's about uh, tough challenges and uh, learning how efficient like you, you use Ryu to get through those levels. You know, if it's adhering to that philosophy, then that's good level design. So mm. it's kind of a, I think it's a kind of a broad enough but like enough. it's but still it's broad enough but I think it's also specific enough to kind of like encompass the general idea of like what good game design is for different genres yeah and like a horror game would be something like oh it makes you feel small in the space or something like that we are claustrophobic right. gangles we are uh, but there are also mechanics which add to that like, yeah. yeah yeah and I think the visuals play a part in that as, as well so like if sometimes your inability to fight enemies does too because like i feel like if 
like take Silent Hill for example. If everything was just like green, like all the walls were just green, the floor is green, it would be very, <laughs> it would be very disorienting. Yeah. So I think part of what makes good world and level design is how well the developers are able to create an aesthetic that uh, allows you to be able to, you know, understand where you are. Yeah. It, it also, that's another thing where um, just kind of a pile on. It needs to inform the emotion of the experience because so much of that is just the colors you're exposed to and the visuals of a given level. I mean, you could dress uh, the same level up in two different ways. Like, here's the same hitboxes and all that, but you would dip, you remove, you change the items, you change the coloring and the lighting and all that, and it gives you a completely different feeling of going through it. <clears throat> right? If, I would agree yeah. with that. Um, yeah. I feel like some of the obvious uh, choices for what makes a good level would be variety. And... Fuck, uh, yeah, I had someone, uh, something else, uh, cohesiveness, I guess. Like, it needs to make sense. You can't mm. just um, have cliffs or floating platforms in a world where that isn't a thing. I, and, and going back to what Acer said about how the, dis, like, the aesthetic can change how you look at it. Like, if you have, like, tattered pieces of wood blocking the way that can give you an idea like oh my god i can hit it and i can get through but if you change that to like a steel door but the same effect works i think that's bad conveyance mm. yeah we also need to look at the um <coughs> the mechanics of course are another lens through which the player is going to uh absorb the world he's going to look through they're going to look through look at the world through the lens of what can i and can't i do so a level for metal gear solid 3 is of course not going to be good in a game like skyrim i'm trying to go somewhere with this thought hold on I, th I think my problem with this subject material in general is that the answer is it depends on the game, and I'm trying to I'm trying to mine out something deeper to say about it. Yeah, I I feel you on that. Like I just thought, because the impetus for this was the messenger, where it made it it, it kind of struck me how great the level design was. But how bad the world design was, and that's what mm -hmm. made me think like, okay, but what is good world uh, world design? What is good level design? I decide just narrow it down to good level design. Um, although we we're talking about world design anyway, so whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean that the level design in Messenger works because it it plays to the mechanics. I mean it's it's challenging. The enemy placements make sense, and then there's this unique mechanic, uh, the the cloud step. Where if you defeat a, or if you you strike projectile in the air, then you get a new jump, right? And you can a projectile, a lantern, or you defeat an enemy. Yeah, exactly. And you can in most levels you can tell, oh, I see a platform up there, I can't reach it, but I see an enemy over there, it's going to shoot my way. So clearly, um, I can go over there to the enemy, jump on his platform, then jump over to get there. Or I can just skip it and hit his projectile. And then get up there. Like you, you, you can clearly tell how the uh, idea of the cloud step informs a lot of the level design, and mm. that makes sense for later runs if you want to speed run again, or if you just want to feel good because you mastered that technique. All that shit works. Have you ever? Have you guys ever played a game where? something about the level design was miscommunicated and you didn't exactly know what to do maybe you had to google your way out of it maybe you had to just you know bang your head against the wall for 10 minutes before you made it made sense that oh i'm supposed to jump up this wall has there ever been a moment you've been playing a game that comes up and you think oh well that actually works because these are the designs of the game that has happened to me rarely but it has happened to me in some rpgs with uh with pre-rendered backgrounds where it 
can be hard sometimes to tell like where exactly I can go mm-hmm. next. Usually it's fine, right? They'll have like a big door and it's like, I can just walk through the door. They'll have stairs. I'll just go, you know, up, up the, the stairs. stairs or climb a ladder or whatever. But there will be some occasions like there was one set of stairs I couldn't even tell that it was a it was supposed to be a set of stairs in like Final Fantasy Nine, I think, and I w- I remember being a kid and I was stuck there for ages. I was stuck in this town. I didn't know how to progress, all because uh, there there was this one it, like set of stairs. At least I think it's a set of stairs. I don't know. You're, it's it's mm-hmm. it was like all the way on the left side of the screen, and I could go down, and I didn't realize it. But is there is there any time that has occurred to you and you've retroactively been like, oh wait, that was actually a good piece of level design because that supports the game's goal of like confusing you or something like that? Uh, nothing comes to mind. Nah, I'm trying to gauge if we can say with confidence that it's never a good idea to make it, to for the ga- for the level to. Uh, be bad to read i don't want to say never yeah i don't want to say never either but i generally speaking it's a bad idea yeah i would say that you would have to be profoundly confident in your skills as a level designer to intentionally do that Mm. and, and make it work it would have to make complete sense in the story and all that stuff. Um, I will say that there was um, there was one part in Hellblade where you're running around in the darkness, and that part, I would say that like, it 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 was it was kind of co- it was kind of annoying to to get through that part, but. I think it made sense. Mm. So I kind of forgave it. I was just like, I don't know, but I don't know if I turn around and say like, oh, it was actually good level design, but I would at least say like for the purposes of the story and the, and what it was trying to do. And I, I was like, it's fine. There's a cool bit in God of War one where you need to go through a sandstorm and you can't see anything. Um, oh. and you're supposed to follow the voice of a siren because you need to, to kill the three sirens somewhere in the desert and that will open the temple door oh yeah that's right that. That's a, that that's is a, a good really example cool set piece um, and also like the level itself has design because you can just run around in the desert for a while and you find well, you will find some, some chests and, and some faces to break and all that so there's exploration there if you have the patience, but then also like you just can't see anything. I guess you can still read it because you're supposed to listen to the sounds and follow them. Hmm. I can also imagine that a um, there's probably a level in like Super Mario 64 or something where you go like, well, this doesn't make any sense. But then you uh, revisit it, like maybe the clock t- level or something like that where the level changes depending on when or where you enter it. And you, there's like a realization of like, oh, no, this is even better than I thought it was because it read poorly the first time. Oh, yeah, kind of like, I think it's called Big, Wet Wet World. Uh, so like in that one, uh, depending on where on the portrait, like if it was high or low, it def- it changes the elevation of the water. Ah, I see. I thought that was just randomized. No, if you if you jump at it towards the top of the painting, then the water is very high. But if you jump at it towards the bottom, and it's very low. Yeah, but that's that's um that that's not really an example though of a world reading poorly. But I'm sure there is and there is probably a great example of that in a platformer or something like that where. It makes sense when you play it again. Because it's hiding like a twist or something. Right. Um, Okay, is there anything... I think we've come to the logical conclusion to this discussion. Does anyone else have anything to add? 
the logical uh, conclusion being <laughs> what we said at the beginning <laughs> uh, that that level design is very specific to what the goals of the game are I think we uh, also did some digging around to sort of see like hey can this work this work yeah, I don't think there's any like universal rules like this is good level design. It really, it's kind of a weak, <laughs> it kind of a lip dick kind of fucking <laughs> conclusion. To be fair, but yeah, yeah it, it does depend on the game. You can tell good level design when it's happening, but it's hard to break down. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree with that. All right. So do we wanna do we wanna wrap it up or do we you guys wanna talk about Evangelion? No. <laughs> to sort of make up for the as you put it, limp dick <laughs> subject. One of these days yeah. we're gonna have No we don't. I mean maybe. I don't know. It's it it's probably not worth it. <laughs> I kinda wanna so, revisit it, but uh I, I want to revisit it as well, just because it's been so long. I don't know how I'll, I'm going to feel about it anymore, but I'm not in a rush. So, uh, Acer, do you, what, what do you have planned? You still working on uh, Kotar? Yes. I'm, I'm juggling between my head now. Am I going to re-record the whole thing again? Because I'm like, I'm like 80% satisfied. But I could push it back a week or two and re if I re-record it all again. But if I do, then it's going to eat into my Sekiro time. Mm, that's, a, that's a valid concern. That is, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm probably just going to launch it like 90% as good as it could be. What, <laughs> what bothers you about the recording you have right now? Uh, it, it's both the recording and some of like the pacing where I feel like there are points which are unnecessary to make and maybe some points I should like I should introduce this subject earlier on so it makes sense when I start like expanding on it later and also this just doesn't feel like it naturally flows into this discussion it's just like I don't know man <laughs> I mean I, I, you can fix a lot of that in editing I feel like I would, yeah. I, would, I would say to fix it like if you're it sounds like you're pretty dissatisfied rather rather than you know push it out there and then eternally look back on it and be like oh that could have been better like just do, do what you think is best now and yeah it might it might eat into your Sekiro time but I think you'll be happier with it in the end I think uh, I think that's the best way to do it I also think that if I'm gonna do that I'm gonna cut it by like 10 or 15 minutes so, because I can't, I, mean, I just can't make an hour-long video again out of this. If you can just cut something without like having to shuffle through the through other parts of the video, you should definitely do that. Mm. Okay, I'll do that. What are you guys doing? Poking. <laughs> don't, don't everyone speak at once here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on my comeback. Um, should be done soon. I still don't want to say what it is. And okay, I, fair I enough. I also started writing on my uh, Gorogoa analysis. I'm like in the... I say started you know, in the f fifth chapter now. There's only five of them. So mm. the first draft should be done relatively soon. Probably going to send it your way, Daniel. But that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Can I... Uh, can I guess what your comeback is? Sure. Is it like a Legacy of Cain lore video? No. <laughs> okay. After I specifically tweeted, I'm not going to do that today. Yeah, I was I was uh, going through Twitter while we were on a break, while we did the break earlier. But yeah, my Legacy of Cain video is somehow trending again. I mean, not on the trending page, but you can kind of tell... When the algorithm is picking it up again, and suddenly there's a whole more comments again. Yeah. And it's always the same comments. <laughs> like, some of them are nice, <laughs> and they say, thank you for making this. It was very cool. And then come the people who say, I can't believe you hate Soul Reaver 1. La 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 la, <laughs> that game was so great at its time. 
please repeat the same shit again and don't go <laughs> don't actually respond to any of the arguments I made do people ever mock you for your accent uh, not mocking but yeah that's part of it are you from Germany <laughs> I find that a lot in my videos it's either people being like oh I l nice video I liked it or it's people like you sound like a fucking idiot you sound like <laughs> this guy this youtuber are you this other guy who plays Fortnite it's like no no I only do this come on just have to read the channel name clearly that's not the same name <laughs> no they, they think I have uh, two channels yeah like, oh my god, you sound exactly like this Russian guy. Like, what are you talking about? I don't sound remotely <laughs> Russian. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, YouTube comments. What a joy. Yeah. The best. Are you doing anything else, Bogan? Like, with my life? <laughs> no, I just feel like I kind of hijacked your, uh, your little <laughs> ending <Okay>. there. <laughs> I wanted to give it back no, to I you. Think two videos are enough. Okay. Well, since no one's gonna fucking ask, <laughs> um, I'm still. Daniel, working. Daniel, what are you working on? A bit late you, there, but I'll take it. You can edit it. Come on! Oh my god! <laughs> I'm not the one editing. Well, you can also edit the audio. I mean, <laughs> nothing's stopping you. Even I if I edit already edited the audio, you can still edit it further. Uh, <laughs> nah, I'm good. Anyways. <laughs> what are you working on, Daniel, aside from editing this podcast? <laughs> um, so I'm still working on the school days video. I was initially kind of trepidatious about it because I realized as I was writing it that I was also actively criticizing the show instead of just f focusing on the ending. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and until I showed what I had to someone and... She said, no, this actually works really well. and Because uh, I felt that there might have been a conflict because I felt like, well, I'm kind of selling this as like, hey, I'm examining the ending. But like, I'm also criticizing the show. I thought that there was a conflict there. And she said that there wasn't because it's all in service of explaining the ending as well. So I thought, you know, that that's a good way of looking at it. So uh, I've been working on that. And I'm, it's probably not going to be too, too long, maybe like a 10, 15 minute video. Uh, the biggest hang up with it is just rewatching the show because I hate that show. It's the fucking worst, but, uh, as <laughs> eventually I will push through, I, I will push through the pain. Are you and planning to do something with uh, devil may cry? I'm not sure. Uh, cause kind of my mindset when it comes to this sort of thing is like I have to be inspired mm. and just because Del May Cry is like my favorite thing ever that, that doesn't necessarily mean it will inspire me to write something like I fucking hate school days but that inspired <laughs> you know that, that inspired me to write about it because there was something there that like made me want to go like yeah I need there, there's something I want to say here um so, Devil May Cry may make me do that if I play it. I don't know. I'll have to play it first. Hmm. So, aren't you working on, like, three videos at once? Um, kind of. Like, mainly right now, it's the School Days video, as well as the Tales of Zestiria critique. Yeah. How far are you into the cutscenes? Of Zestiria? Yeah. Same as you before. You were watching... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, I was thinking, like, it's it'll be harder for me to uh, experience both school days and Tales of the Serious cutscenes at the same time. Like, that's too much for me. I don't, I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to power through school days first, and then I'm going to go back to Tales of the All right. So thank you for joining us. This has been Daniel Santos with Acer Aesthetics and Bokinjima. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.